Um, we are continuing our journey with the defenders of the faith. And this week we're going to meet two very different gentlemen. So let me go over to the PowerPoint and get, get that shared. And we will start with that. Okay, let's get over to from the beginning. There we go. All right, so Irenaeus, I put a question mark after 115 um, because some people say it's 125. Most say he was born 115. But again, you know, they didn't do the whole birth certificate thing. And then you have um, Tertullian from 160 to 240. So these are the two gentlemen we're going to look at today. Um, and I think you might end up being a little perplexed with Tertullian as well when we go through with him. But we're going to start with Irenaeus. All right. Going back to my timeline, because I enjoy seeing it. I know Kathy does too. Just so we get an idea of the time frame we are speaking about. So Irenaeus comes on board, again, somewhere 115 or 125. Um, and he is in the, um, he's under the emperor Hadrian. Um, and if you want to place that into <laughs> history, Hadrian's wall, okay, that would be him. And then Tertullian comes later. Now, Irenaeus, he's in the middle of Justin Martyr's line up here near the top in the green. Um, and you'll find a connection there. And we're going to discuss the connection he has with Polycarp as well. I find it fascinating that as we look at these uh, second century apologists, as they're labeled, many of them were under Polycarp at some point. So let's go to the next slide. Here we go, Irenaeus. I'm gonna stick with 115. Most of the historical sites and uh, early church websites have it 115, others have 125. Anyway, he's born in Smyrna, yes, where Polycarp was bishop. So he was a disciple of Polycarp and his conversion, they're not sure if born to a Christian family or not to a Christian family. Again, there is sketchy information. Um, what we do know about him is once he is under Polycarp for training, education, catechesis, all of that, he begins to desire to tell others the gospel. And so Polycarp has him moved to Rome, um, where, and as Polycarp would put it, where the church of Peter and Paul are. And so he goes to Rome and he begins, if you remember from last week's lesson, Justin Martyr began a school. That's where Irenaeus goes for further education in the Christian faith. And he picks up Justin Martyr's desire to defend the faith as well. While he's in Rome, he is called to become the new bishop in Lugdunum, which is Lyon's France. Okay, but I need to back up a little bit. Septimus Severus, according to Jerome, was the bishop in Lyon. He is martyred. And what happens is Irenaeus is in Lyon, okay, and he is carrying with him to Rome, back to Rome, a letter concerning Montanism from Gaul back to Rome. While he is gone, the emperor 
sends out an edict to slaughter the Christians. And Septimus was arrested. Okay, oops, let me go back. Okay, Septimus, um, if any of you are familiar with Reverend Wolf Mueller's two books on the martyrdom of two women, I forget their name right now, um, but Septimus is their bishop and he's arrested with them. And the story is that um, he is like 93 or 98 years old and the people did not care. He's dragged to trial, he's stoned, um, put in front of beasts, uh, his, he gets head wounds and body wounds and he, is, he ends up dying back in prison from the wounds. Well, had Irenaeus still been in the city of Leons, he probably would have been arrested as well, but God in his providence had him going to Rome with a letter of concern because the Montanists were coming back in. Now, who remembers what the Montanists believed? I know it's stretching back to our um, lessons on the heresies. Anyone remember? We dealt with the Montanists and the Marcionites about the same time. And the Montanists um, believed in new prophecy. Now keep this in mind because when the next guy, Tertullian, shows up, we're going to meet the Montanists yet again. So let's see what Irenaeus taught. Okay, um, a lot of his writings were not only to um, Christians to guard against heresies, but it was to Christians to remember what we believe. One of the things is that the bread and wine are no longer ordinary bread. We say it's both bread and the body, wine and the blood. But that goes all the way back to, to the early apologists who, again, if we think the timeline, they were wrong, Polycarp and others would have been correcting them. So even Irenaeus says that the bread we receive is no longer ordinary bread. It, it, it is the body and blood of Christ. Keep that in mind because it's going to be important. Okay, so his service to the church. He served as a bishop, an apologist, a writer, and then was martyred for the faith as well. One of uh, the favorite quotes I have for him, because I've realized this in the many years that I was in error, is that error never shows itself in its naked reality in order not to be discovered. On the contrary, it dresses elegantly so that the unwary may be led to believe that it is more truthful than truth itself. I wrote an article once that Satan does not come in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork, but Satan comes as scripture says, as an angel of light. And so Irenaeus was beginning to deal with Gnosticism Marcionism and Montanism. And Montanists are all about new prophets, new prophecies, new revelation. Um, and of course, the Marcionites, they don't like the Old Testament, so you've got two different gods there. Um, the Gnostics are all about you can have secret knowledge, God talks to you in your heart, um, and you get to have super spiritual experiences and, and so forth. So this is what Irenaeus is dealing with as well as caring for the sheep of his pasture as an under shepherd to the great shepherd. Okay. 
So he writes this book, or this three book series called Against Heresies or the Heretics or Adversus Heresis. And these are the things he is dealing with in each of the books. Now the picture there is the set of three that I have. Um, and unlike the lost books we had with some of the apologists that are only being recovered, the majority of this work we have. Some other things are from quotes, but the majority is actually copies we have. So he deals first with Valentinus and Valentinus is Gnostic. He believes that God uh, and everything is an eon and maybe not real, maybe real, maybe it has matter, maybe it doesn't have matter. Anyway, then he's dealing with Simon Magus. And if that name's familiar, that's because the teaching that if you paid enough and you gave enough, God would give you spiritual gifts. Then we have Menander, Carpa. Prates, and I spelled that wrong, should be an A before the T. The Ebionites, the Nicolaitans, which we read in Revelation, and you want to look these up, go back to the Panarian series. Serdo, there goes Martian, there goes Tatian, Montanists, and Gnostics. And he deals with all of those in books one and two. So that's where those are at. The third book is against the heresies book three. But before I get there, I wanna talk about another book that he wrote. And we only have an Armenian copy of this. That's the only copy we have um, part of the Eastern Orthodox Church and true to form began to release copies of manuscripts and works that they had only about 40, 50 years ago. And we have the proof or demonstration of the apostolic preaching. This was written for the people of God to strengthen those who were already believers. And the difference in his book against the heresies and this, you can feel the shepherd's heart of Irenaeus in this book. Another beautiful thing about this particular text is we get a real glimpse into the doctrines that were being taught to the church only past the 170s AD. And everything lines up with scripture. And again, there is this, this beautiful preservation of the apostolic teachings among the early bishops and apologists. So in the book Against Heresies, we find he is um, bold, he calls a spade a spade. He is um, honest and truthful. He is imploring those who are in heresy to return to the church. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't try to make the message nice and or accommodate the hearing of these people. He's not trying to make the gospel suddenly palpable, but if it's an offense, it's an offense. If it's the smell and fragrance of life, that's what it is. If it's the stench of death to others, that's what it is. His style is very much bold. I'm not going to back down. I'm telling you you're in error and you're headed to hell in your error. And he doesn't, we would say he doesn't take his foot off the gas pedal in any of it. Um, but his style in doing that is to constantly go back to the apostles and their teachings. So one of the quotes 
from his book is we have learned none others, the plan of our salvation or from none others, then from those through whom the gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public and at a later period by the will of God handed down to us in the scriptures to be the ground and pillar of our faith. Now, remember, by the by 178, 180, 190, the scriptures are circulating among the churches. We're beginning to see codices where people are putting the books together. Um, but not everyone had all of them together. Um, you have like the gospels bound, you have the book of Acts maybe bound with the gospels, you have the letters of Paul circulating. A lot of it as well was, say, let's say Polycarp saying, I heard from the apostle John such and such, and it's in his letter to the churches, letter number one, two, or three, take your pick, or it's in the gospel. Um, but there was a lot of verbal transmission at that time, although people were told, search the scriptures, search the scriptures. So his appeal in his apologetic form is apostolic in the sense that he was always refuting the errors and heresies by saying, the apostles never taught that. The apostles never taught that. The scripture doesn't say that. Or the Old Testament says this about Christ, and you say this. Um, the Old Testament said a virgin would conceive. You say a young lady. The scripture says a virgin. So he'd go back to the apostolic teachings, and he would refute by using the scriptures. And he was refuting those who were saying they're Christian, but they weren't because they had major heresies. We're not talking just minor errors. We're talking full-blown, you can't be a Christian if you believe this type of stuff. Another style of his was very Trinitarian. He looked at the work of God as all three persons of the Godhead engaged in our salvation. And he would remind the heretics, God is three in one. He would remind the church, we, we proclaim Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as God. Hold on, let's get them in here. Okay. And so that's where he would take the Trinity and explain God the Father loved so much he sent his son and his son loves us so much he gives us his spirit he was very christological in the sense that the bible the scriptures were about jesus and that reminded me of something my pastor once said to me all theology is christology everything you believe about god about the word Everything is all about Christ. And we know that from Luke, when Jesus is walking with the two men on the road to Emmaus, he points and says all the scriptures, and he teaches them from Moses, from the Psalms, from David, from the prophets. All of this was about me. He also had a practical side to him. In his work to the church, the apostolic um, letters, he explains why sometimes God permits us to suffer. He uses the fact that they are under serious persecution, not that it's purifying us or sanctifying us, more that it's a witness to what Christ has done for us on the cross because of his resurrection. So he was very practical in his writings as well. And you really get a sense of this pastoral heart in Irenaeus. Come on, there we go. In book three, this one, on page 35, 
Um, I had this outlined because I used it in one of my upcoming books. But you find the creed in his writings. It's the second paragraph. And what he's doing is he's explaining that even the barbarians who have come to faith, barbarian being everyone outside of being a Roman or a citizen, they were barbarians. He says, many nations of the barbarians who believe in Christ give assent, having salvation written in their hearts through the spirit without paper and ink. They believe, namely, in one God, the creator of heaven and earth, and of all things which are in them, and in Jesus Christ, son of God, who, because of his surpassing love toward the creature, he fashioned and accepted to be born of the virgin. And so by himself, he united man with God, suffered under Pontius Pilate, rose again, was taken up in glory, and will come in glory as savior of those who are saved and as judge of those who are judged. We can see the, the elements of that rule of faith that creedal statement and for my Baptist and Pentecostal friends I know who are watching because you tell me the creed is biblical this is how simply teach what we believe and if you look at the phrasing of it you see things very familiar if you know that the Apostles Creed and the Nicene Creed they're in there early Christians understood the necessity to truncate what we believe so they could proclaim and defend what they were believing. Now, in the third book, he is explaining to the heretics of the day, the Gnostics and so forth, that this is what the church confesses even outside the Roman church, even outside the Greek speaking church. The church everywhere confesses this. If you don't confess this, you are not part of us. Us being church with a capital C. Okay, so I wanted to go through book three a little bit. He starts, and, and if you get the book or if you have it, um, it's part of ancient Christian writers. He goes in the, from the get-go what the apostolic traditions are through the ascension of the bishops and the succession, I should say, of the bishops from the apostles. He names who named who as a bishop just before they passed away or were martyred. And so, again, he's going back to the apostles in his argument and to the scriptures that they've written in his argument. He goes on to prove Christ is called God and Lord in the Bible, and no one else is God and Lord except Jesus, born of a virgin. He uses the four Gospels and the book of Acts as witnesses to the Gospel, as witnesses to, to the fact that what these heretics are teaching is not what the church teaches. He offers the proof from the word that Christ is God's word, the Logos. He talks now, this is where it starts getting where if you have friends who think this way, get at least book three and arm yourself well with the way he argued for the next few things. So he argued with those who said, well, Joseph was, uh, Jesus was begotten by Joseph. He was man born of natural causes. There's a lot of people who think that. Or the newest fad, Mary had sex with a Roman officer and to hide the whole thing, they made up the story that she was a virgin. The arguments in Irenaeus against Joseph being the natural father, you can use when they come to you and say, well, Mary really had sex, <laughs> not with Joseph, but with a Roman guard. The next is the proof that a virgin will conceive and not a young girl. 
This is popular amongst um, many modern evangelicals in the Jewish community that Mary, what, you know, that word virgin in Isaiah doesn't really mean virgin. It means young woman. He brings out a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step argument to show the text means she'd never had sex before. She was a virgin. It's an excellent, uh, it's probably six or seven pages long in his development, excellent resource to combat that. The next thing he battles in his work is that Jesus isn't Mary's seed. We know Jesus is Mary's seed. And he argues the egg from Mary is what God used and the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And he's fully human because he came from Mary. Well, how many of you know Mennonites or have heard of them? Simon Menno taught and many still believe God didn't use Mary's seed. How could he use a seed from a sinner to make Jesus? So the Mennonites, the Amish, many, do not believe Jesus is actually from the seed of a woman. No, no, because elsewhere it says, a body you have prepared for me. That has nothing to do with the incarnation aspect, that it was still Mary's seed. Mary's egg, the Holy Spirit made to Jesus. But his argument, and I didn't realize this, this theory was this old. So if you're coming up to a Mennonite or someone who says, well, how did Jesus, how could God use this, the egg of Mary? Because she's a sinner. Hello, he's God. But he, he has a much better um, apologetic for that. And he explains how it is a fulfillment to the promise to Eve. Now, I posted in my group a picture, which I since removed because I didn't realize the feet, what was going on with that. But the idea was that Eve, in her sin and refusal to submit to God's command, don't eat of that tree, bound us all up. Now we know the Bible says Adam sinned, we fell. Irenaeus looked and said Eve was the one who did not submit to Adam or to God. Mary did submit. And in Mary's submission to God, that began the untying of the sin knot. The way it's quoted in the picture I had was kind of made it look like Mary was the one who helps free us. When I read the whole quote, it's simply because she submitted and said to the angel, you know, let it, you know, do it, be it unto me. And then she rejoiced. It is because of that, that it undoes Eve. And so he was showing a correlation that Eve in her not submitting, we all fell because Adam sinned, but Mary in submitting because Christ is born, we are freed. So I took that off my, my Facebook page because I was like, oh, that's not the whole quote. And the whole quote clarified it. So, okay, next. Irenaeus, here we go with some of those early teachings that are just so pesky to the Baptists and, and Anabaptists. Baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I put a big X in the Anabaptist view because they view your baptism is your step of obedience. I will never forget. I was converted as an adult. You guys know that from previous videos. And when I went to my pastor, at the wonderful Holiness Pentecostal Church, I said to him, I know I need to be baptized. I had not ever been baptized as a child or an infant. And he said, I'm so glad you're willing to take this step of obedience. And I thought, oh, okay. And I walked away, yay, I'm gonna go get baptized. 
For some, it's a leap of faith. Get baptized to make sure you're going to follow the Lord. And you're going to have a wonderful walk with God from now on. It lasts forever until you sin and you need to get baptized again. And this is true. I know us, I know some of these things come as a shock to my Lutheran brothers and sisters. When you change churches in the Southern Baptist Church, you have to get baptized again. Because it's not even I'm showing dedication to Christ. It's a membership thing for a lot of them. So I have friends baptized two, three, four, even one baptized seven times. I have another friend who refused to get baptized because it was so work oriented. She wasn't quite sure she would stay with Jesus when she became reformed she ended up understanding it better and now as a lutheran she understands even better but the baptist view it's not for the forgiveness of sins it's your act of obedience towards god and you telling the world i'm going to follow jesus from now on irenaeus however in 189 says and when we come to refute them the gnostics we shall show in its fitting place that this class of men have been instigated by Satan to a denial of that baptism, which is regeneration to God. Who? Oh, that's a teaching instigated by Satan. I have to agree because it binds you. It locks you. It puts chains on your arms and on your feet. Because suddenly, maybe I wasn't quite ready, and I did it anyway, and I was, it wasn't real. I had a friend who looked at me after her third baptism, and she said, I told God we got it right this time. <sighs> okay, that's the concept of the Anabaptist, whether you're Pentecostal, Baptist, Mennonite, Amish, Methodist, whatever you are, that's the idea. But Irenaeus says that's been instigated by Satan. Hmm. Bit harsh? No. No. Luther called them enthusiasts and said, don't tolerate them in your churches. Okay. And Irenaeus continues, for the visible, for the baptism instituted by the visible Jesus was for the remission of sins. Isn't that wonderful? Okay continue. He also says in his apostolic preaching in 192, now faith occasions this for us, even as the elders, the disciples of the apostles have handed it down to us. First of all, it bids us to keep in mind that we have received baptism for the remission of sins. Then he goes on, this baptism is the seal of eternal life and the new birth. There it is again. That pesky baptism saves in the early church. I find it amazing that in a current movement among evangelicals to return to the ancient church practices, they haven't yet found this little one. So instigated by Satan, I already went through that. Um, another one, in some lost writings that are actually quoted by Jerome. For as we are lepers in sin, we are made clean by means of the sacred water and the invocation of the Lord. And then he quotes, except a man be born again through water and the spirit, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to sideline for my Anabaptist friends right now. That term, born again through water and the spirit, was never clarified to me when I was an Anabaptist. They would teach the water meant the birthing water, the fluid we're in before we're born. And so we need to be born and then born of the spirit. But that doesn't, I would always ask, well, what happens to the baby that died in vitro? What about that baby? Not born of water. That water has to be something else. Never got a satisfactory 
answer and they can't answer it until I became Lutheran and understood that meant baptismal waters and the spirit who works through those baptismal waters with the word. So when your friends who are evangelical ask you to get baptized again, because now as an adult, you believe in Jesus, bring this scripture up to them from John 3. Oh, you tell me what this water is here. They can't. They will hem and hawk. They will try to answer it away and talk their way out of it. You keep sticking with that because that teaching that it's their decision to get baptized will bind them in misery their entire Christian life. And eventually someone's going to say to them, well, maybe you didn't really mean it. You should just go get baptized again, which is what's happened to friends of mine. And they are bound in depression and despair because of this. And I will agree with Irenaeus, anabaptism ideas, definitely not from scripture. And they are from the father of lies. Okay. Martyrdom of St. Irenaeus. <sighs> Two stories, very different. One is he was taken, arrested, and put on trial, and he was beheaded along with several other Christians and leaders and presbyters in Lyon. Others say he didn't get arrested. Others did, and he died peacefully. Either way, Irenaeus is an apologist, a bishop, a pastor. We Christians today, should get to know. We should be reading his books, especially his work for the Christians and to encourage us. And when you read it, you will find out the practices in our liturgy stem from the ancient church. The way we have the call to worship, the confession, the absolution, and onward straight through to ending with the Lord's Supper. That is how the ancient church worshiped. We join with them when we come and worship in the divine service and not some contemporary musical version of that. <sighs> That's for another lesson. Okay, now to my perplexing apologist Tertullian. He is the first black apologist in the church. Born in Carthage, he was an adult convert. And I have this verse under his name because what I put in bold and made a little bigger is what he did in his faith. He shipwrecked his own faith. He started out great and in the end, he joins with the heretics. He, for me, is a warning. I may have some things right now, but I didn't before coming Lutheran. I may have had the gospel right. Jesus died for our sins, but I didn't have everything right. And I certainly had a distorted gospel. Tertullian started off right and made shipwreck of his faith. Just as Paul warned about those two gentlemen that Timothy was overseeing and how they shipwrecked their faith. So we're going to go real quick through him because he is just perplexing even to the early church. Okay, good things he did. He wrote all true teachings come from Christ to the church through the apostles, the scriptures. He wrote against Marcion, who had said there was an uh, old, uh, old Testament God, he was mean. You have a New Testament God, he's full of love. In his work against Marcion, he has some of the strongest arguments that the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New, and it's all about Jesus in both Testaments. <clears throat> he also in his writings against Marcion, actually demonstrates 
how we can use the scripture to refute the heretics. This is what makes me sad. Okay. In his work on praxis, which simply means practice, he's the first one in the church and among the church apologists from the second century who actually uses the word Trinity to describe the three persons of the Godhead. Those are good things. On baptism, happy is our sacrament of water in that by washing away the sins of our early blindness, we are set free and admitted into eternal life. Oh my goodness, there goes baptismal regeneration. Good thing, bad. This is where he starts to slide down. Remarriage after his spouse died is a sin. Bible never said that, but some of the Gnostics did. And all priests, presbyters, and bishops should be celibate because sex is bad. Well, in the, in the structure that God gave us in, the, in marriage, it's a good thing. We procreate that way. But no, 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 it's just a bad thing. And so, again, you start seeing emphasis on preference instead of emphasis on doctrine. And as Jerome stated, he said lapsed into Montanism. I say walked. He walked right into it. He met with him, with um, Montan, and immediately bonded with him. So what's Montanism again? Oh, yeah. Montanism. Montanism decided he was going to speak and talk strangely and prophesy. And he was going to give new revelations. If you remember, he had two prophetesses that worked with him. And eventually, Montanus decided he was the paraclete that Jesus promised to the disciples, the comforter. That was him. He was the paraclete. This is what Tertullian fell into. Montanus is the pre-Pentecostal. <clears throat> we would call modern Pentecostals neo-Montanists, speak in a strange, unearthly language. Go to certain churches, um, the Toronto Blessing, uh, Brownsville, Florida, Hillsong. I know a lot of us listen to their songs, chuck them out. They're all Montanists, and it's all about some spiritual talking to God. Um, Bethel Church, um, I can give other names that you would know. Osteen, Copeland, Benny Hinn, all Montanists. T.D. Jakes, Trinitar anti-Trinitarian Montanist, Paula White, uh, Joyce Meyer, the ex-LCMS lady. She's a Montanist now. And all of them are believing God still speaks, still reveals, still tells you secret things and nobody else knows. So the ancient church had some opinions on Tertullian because he's complicated. His arguments against Marcion are fabulous, and yet he falls into Montanism. Lactanius, uh, Lactantius, I'm going to get these Latin names right one day. He said Tertullian is unpolished, his writing's too obscure, meaning he, he didn't specifically tackle things. Also, he said he didn't tackle them with the scriptures, except in the book against Marcion, and that he fell in with false prophets and never repented of that. There's that warning. You could start off great. Gotta finish well to get the crown of eternal life. Eusebius, he had a little more positive. He was a great orator in Rome, and I'm sure he was. Jerome saddened 
by his lapse into Montanism. This is why Tertullian is a perplexing apologist for the ancient church. Some of his early works, fabulous. And then in the end, not so good. Kind of reminds me of N.T. Wright. Fabulous work on the resurrection. Probably the best among Anglicans and evangelicals. I find Pastor Bombaro the best among Lutherans on that. But N.T. Wright is denying certain things now, key things. Yeah, start off, you gotta finish well. So next week, we're gonna meet a gentleman who wrote probably one of the most fascinating pieces of literature from the early church. It is called Octavius, written about 175. And what it is, again, from ancient Christian writers, what it is, is it's a literary piece of apologetics. He's writing not in the sense of just going to argue against the heretics or send a letter to Rome. He writes a story. And in the story, he has a pagan and a Christian. And they are discussing things. And on the road, as they're walking, the pagan sees an idol. And he bows before it, kisses it, puts alms in front of it. And the Christian says, the thing is just stone and wood. Why are you worshiping that? Let me tell you about the one true God. And so we're going to look at his literary work of apologetics. See, C.S. Lewis, J.R. Tolkien, and that type were not the first to use literary skills. A fictional story to express the Christian faith. That started... 175 AD. And I chose him, I had a couple of options from about the same era, because of something that happened this weekend. You've all probably seen my little Luther Rose. What's this got to do with the literary? Well, this weekend, after the ordination, the four of us decided we were going to go eat. And I hemmed in hot. It was hot in Utah. As hot as probably here. And I hemmed in hot. Which shirt do I wear? So I'd opted for my Creedal Apologetics t-shirt. And put on my necklace again. Okay. We'll go. And we went. And we went out to eat. At a really wonderful restaurant. Brazil restaurant where they slice everything off the skewer. Fabulous food. But we got there. We needed to wait about 40 minutes for a table. That's how popular it was. So as I'm standing there giving my name to the manager, another waitress comes over. What a pretty necklace. Okay. She goes, what does it mean? Remember, I've always said, there are always going to be some kind of opportunity to give the gospel. A simple necklace. She didn't even look at my t-shirt about creedal apologetics and defending the faith like the ancient church. My necklace. And I began to explain the white flower, the heart, the cross. Turns out she belongs to a small non-denominational church. And as I began explaining, she said, well, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son. And I went on. She immediately lit up. We believe that. And she says to me, do you teach this? Well, yes, I do. So, gave her my card, and Lord willing, I'll be able to make a trip back down to Utah to teach some young non-denominational Christians how to defend the faith. And so, 
a necklace with good Brazilian food can become apologetic and proclamation opportunity. Don't negate any of them. Whatever you can do to get that conversation going. Who knew my choice of wearing not a floral pattern that would have definitely hidden my necklace and I probably would have tucked it in, but I left it out. A necklace, a picture of Luther's rose started a conversation with her. And I'll never forget our friend, he just looked at me and went, you do you. He was like, I'm watching how this unfolded because a simple act wearing a necklace, putting on earrings that have a cross, having a t-shirt with a verse or something. If you're shy about it, do something like that. I did not anticipate having an apologetic brief lesson with this young woman. She couldn't have been more than 19, 20 years old. Her eyes lit up that we Lutherans, and I'm saying what we believe, she believed too. And it can open a door to go in with the gospel that doesn't bring you either pride or despair, but comfort. That's what these lessons are about. You can forget the names. You can forget the heresies. But don't forget, the goal of apologetics is to answer for our faith and proclaim it. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what this is about. This is nothing about how much I know, how much you want to learn. This is about proclaiming the gospel to people who are in dire need for it. And if you think I overemphasize the fact that evangelicals are in bondage, just talk to them about their freedom in Christ. It's not there. We have a message to bring them. So I encourage you, ladies, wear your Luther Rose. You never know when it might spark a conversation while you're waiting 40 minutes for a table to eat. Okay, end of lesson. Comments, questions, clarifications. Go ahead, Pastor. I have a question about uh, when you were talking about Irenaeus and his views on Mary, how she's different than Eve was. Um, it sounds to me like, and I don't know if this is true or not, that maybe uh, Roman Catholic theology got their uh, Mary as co-redemptrix teaching from that kind of language is might that be the case? Yes, because it was a slippery slope. Um, even Terry commented on the photo I had, and if you notice, Terry, I pulled that whole thing down, um, because the way it was quoted just began Mariology. So I pulled it off, I read the original, a little different, but if you go by just a short snippet, oh, it can lead down there. Mm. Which and that's why I took it when I read it. I mean, I thought, I go, oh, no, 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 that doesn't sound right at all. And that's why I commented what I did. And then when you jumped in and said, no, it's this, I'm thinking, that's not the way I read that. <laughs> right. So I was looking at the quote in the meme I found, and then the quote in the book. And I'm going, oh, they chopped up this quote. But something like that will and can and probably did become a slippery slope. I like the fact that, yes, Eve sinned because she didn't submit to her husband or God. God used Mary and her submission where she carried the Savior in her womb. But that's about all as far as I'm going with Mary, because she was a sinner like us. She rejoiced in God, her Savior. If you're sinless, you don't need a Savior. Well, and, and when I was reading, that what kind of comment I made is that there were a lot of say good guys if you will old and new testament followers of Christ people trying to do the right thing trying to submit to God and that in that regard Mary's no different than any of the other righteous people that were there are out there and to put her on a different kind of plane 
just anyway, I, that's where I kind of went. I think we took a right turn somewhere. You know, so that's, <laughs> or a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> or a wrong turn. Or yeah, maybe a left turn. I don't know. No, and I agreed when I was looking at it. Then I had a picture that I've used on my blog. And um, one of the guys on the, he goes, look at the bottom. And unfortunately, the artist, and I love the picture of Eve down, sad, crying, and Mary kind of saying, hey, in the womb is the answer. But on under Mary's feet in the picture was the snake. So I immediately, I was like, oh, off, off that goes. And I took it off my website and everything because I never noticed the feet. I just kind of looked and like, yes, to Eve who fell, and we fell with her and Adam, Mary was carrying the answer, the savior, but the artist had made Mary. So yes, slippery slope, note to self, be very careful. Questions, comments? Sorry, I'm late again. Um, <laughs> okay, Donna. <laughs> I had to read, I ended up, uh, putting Zoom back on again. Anyway, when you were talking about the people that were baptized again and again, it reminded me of um, when I was in Israel and we went to a baptismal site and the, there were three girls that decided they were going to be rebaptized in the Jordan. And one girl, after she was finished, she said, oh, I'm so pleased I was baptized. Maybe it'll work this time. And I thought, what? <laughs> Yeah. And um, I was asked, you know, you can be re-baptized here. And I don't like to just blatantly say, no, no, no. I'll, I'll think about it and, for an explanation. And I said, no. I said, no, I'm not going to be rebaptized. God did it for me the first time. And that's all I'm going to do. I knew that even if I went in there and did it, it wouldn't be any different. But um, I decided to tell them, no, I'm not going to. And I thought everybody, almost everybody in the group is going to be doing it the way they were talking, but it only ended up being three girls. But I just felt so sorry for her. She said, maybe this time it's going to work. Yeah. And that is the evangelical idea. Um, because Anabaptists will just say, well, you have to be an adult. You have to know what you're doing. No. <laughs> It's not what God's word says. Other comments or questions? I just have a, a question about what you just said, Donna. How do they know it didn't work the first time or previous times? The, the, what, are, what are the criteria against which they, they measure this? Um, I guess as a Lutheran and never thinking that baptism wouldn't be effective because it comes from God and God has the power to do anything. So yeah, I just, I just, it really makes me wonder where, what their criteria for success is. Well, I suppose they could be talking that, well, she was, because she's still a sinful person, maybe she doesn't think um, that it's any good. I don't know. Well, she's um, going to be disappointed I, with that one too. <laughs> yes, I know. I know the whole thing. I was very disappointed with the whole thing. Um, at that stage, I didn't know what to say. So I'm very pleased to be taking this, this course mm -hmm. and um, reading the book. But uh, yeah, when you, um, another thing, Nancy, when you were, did you go through the whole um, Apostles' Creed with this girl at the uh, restaurant? Yeah, I quoted it. And I couldn't remember, I knew the whole thing. I mean, I've, I've learned it as an adult. And I went through the whole Apostles' Creed with her. And she could agree with everything. You know, and <clears throat> she was stunned that a Lutheran, belie she believed what a Lutheran believed. And I said, because this is what the Bible teaches. And she said, yes. And when we got to the forgiveness of sins part, she goes, you know, my pastor told me that we don't have to be perfect. We just have to love Jesus. And I said, well, we need to believe who Jesus is. And no, we're never going to be perfect. I said, and that's why we receive the forgiveness of sins from God's gifts. 
And she was like, I need to talk to you and talk to my youth leader at the college and have you come down and teach the other young people. Here's my card. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm praying that that door opens because imagine getting to talk to even two or three 20 year olds to give them, here's the, here's the beautiful gospel, God's gifts that we receive and now go out one or two. I've always, my husband and I, since we're married, even when we were dating and doing things, always prayed, Lord, just one, one. If there can be a difference in one life, and the same with this, if Lord, I can help one person respond to someone's questions about Christianity, I'm done. I've done exactly what you wanted me to do, God. He keeps me here, so evidently I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> but Kathy, in response to your question, the fact it didn't work, the weight of that is on her because it's not God's work. No. So the, the effect of it is on her. And that breaks my heart. Yeah, it does. Because then there's no hope, no foundation, no, nothing that, that she can be sure of. And the Bible gives us so much hope and, and assurance of God's faithfulness and God's power. And, you know, the things that he does for us. Uh, all of those things that that if you think it's you that has to do these things and you think you have to be perfect after that, then the, the, I can understand the despair, yes. you know. And as Reverend Wolf Mueller has said, pride, oh, look at my fruit, woohoo, I'm doing great, to oh, look at my fruit, I'm really doing horrible. <laughs> I'm not even a believer, I gotta go get baptized again. Well, and when I was going to the to the local uh, Baptist ladies Bible study group, there were times where they would say things and I'm going, you're not sure of that. And they're, and they'd say, well, no, how can you be sure? And, Cause Jesus says it like right there in the Bible. And so then I'd flip and I'd read to them the, what Jesus said. And I said, and, and he's, he doesn't lie. And so you can believe that that's why well, I don't, um, my life doesn't show that. Well, no, we're constantly going through, you know, sanctification. Uh, do you think you're better than, you know, that your actions are better than they were when you first became a Christian? Oh, yeah. Well, well how do you think that happens? Did you expect perfection like this? And um, oftentimes they'd sit and listen to me and I would think mostly indulge me. And then they'd go right back into their, oh, woe is me. I'm awful kind of conversation i'm going okay why did i just say that why are you studying the bible if you don't believe what it says but you know what kathy i i'm a retired pastor now from the lcms and um i i thought that i would come down here and, and enjoy sitting in the pews and hearing my sins forgiven from my pastor uh, unfortunately many pastors even in the lcms church today are not preaching Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. They are teaching like these evangelicals teach, you gotta live this holy and godly life to the point that, okay, they'll mention Jesus and sometimes the cross, but the focus is on you and the people in the congregation now I'm finding are even wondering themselves, have I sinned too much? I don't know if I'm really going to be saved, what Jesus is going to say to me on Judgment Day. These are Lutheran Christians coming to Lutheran congregations. They're not hearing their sins forgiven. All they hear is the law. All they that's, hear is the law. That's right. I'm so thankful for my pastor who's, we're, we're in the middle of nowhere, Ontario. <laughs> and... Uh, um, <laughs> but like rural, you know, and since COVID and he's gone on line now to, to, uh, um, you know, that people beyond his congregation are hearing what he has to say. He has changed his preaching a little bit. Um, it was always good balance between law and gospel, but now it's, 
it's still law. He still presents the law, but he gives a lot more comfort in the gospel in some ways um, because people are out there unsettled and, and everything else. And I can't imagine him going more law, <laughs> you know, like, wow. And whereabouts are you located, Pastor Dan? I'm down in Menifee, uh, Southern California. Oh, okay. Do you know where Lake um, Elsinore? I've heard there's a. <laughs> it's well, Riverside, in, Riverside in the... County. Okay, I'll yeah, look it I up was on the map. With your conversation with this young lady, you were in such Mormonville area there in Utah mm -hmm. with this. And if she was going to a non-Mormon church, which it sounds like she was, I can imagine her pastor probably is emphasizing the fact that you don't have to do stuff. You don't have to be perfect because that's the Mormon teaching. Except you know, to that say is... all you have to do is believe Except... Jesus. So I had a discussion with a Mormon student that was kind of like this because I was trying to explain to her that you needed to believe in Jesus and the, you know, Jesus that I believe in to be saved. And she was saying, no, you have to do stuff. And so when I, you know, I was trying to explain to her that, that, you know, Jesus did it all for us and we didn't have to uh, do anything. She goes, you know what they cite for that? She, or at least her seminary teacher told her, he says, but even the devil believed in Jesus. And so he wasn't saved. And so that's what it, the way they go with that and that you can't just believe to be saved. You've got to do something. Mm -hmm. And so when you were saying that, I thought, yeah, I could just see this little gal's, you know, words and, and uh, what's been planted in her head and, you know, what they use to kind of combat that a little bit. You can't well, just believe in Jesus. Even, the evangelical system is not much different than the Mormon in the fact that you got to work and work and work and work to, because sanctification is your job. And staying saved is your job. And getting saved starts out as your job. So you believe in Jesus, you're all good, except if you don't. And there, there is this emphasis once you sit in their churches under their teaching. That is all law. Now, I wrote an article and submitted it because Lutheran Witness had a open submit. And I called it, stop it. Just stop it. The takeoff from a Bob Newman episode. The basis was what I am seeing flood, especially within um, some of the Bible studies and teachings. Like I watch YouTubes from Lutherans and I listen and go, whoa, boy, is that evangelical and not Lutheran. So I, I began with the ideas of having a super high inner experience. We Pentecostals call it mountaintop experience. Um, what never gets mentioned is if you did a mountaintop, you hit in the valley at some point. Um, but there's this, you can get so excited for Jesus. And I get it. We are emotional. God doesn't negate our emotions, but we don't gauge our experience as mountaintop with emotion. I get a mountaintop every time I come to the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other thing was the music. I went to look for a church for a young friend of mine who has become Lutheran without knowing he became Lutheran. So I went looking. He wanted a liturgical church in Orlando. I found 14 LCMS churches. I couldn't recommend one. Not one was liturgical. The only one that was was Spanish, and he doesn't speak Spanish. 13 out of 14 churches in Orlando among the LCMS were contemporary. Did my, not do the liturgy. My the songs, the songs that they had in their bulletin online, Hillsong, Bethel, Phillips, Craig, and Dean, which is an anti-Trinitarian group, and other such heretics. They're singing the songs and their doctrine into their blessed Lutheran hearts and not realizing it because that's the stuff you get on the radio. So you're driving and you're bouncing with the songs on the radio and you have no clue, no clue that those had to go through the CCLI system 
which is not owned by Christians. CCLI is owned by secular companies. And every song that you have to pay for and you pay into your membership for CCLI, that gets divvied up between the copyright holders. Technically, you're paying heretics for their songs. And then the final one was law gospel distinction. We're, we're, thankfully, my pastor keeps that right on point. The, our friend who was just ordained, man, that was boom, boom, boom. You knew law gospel. Pastor Bombaro, when he preached law gospel, and he didn't have the third thing that even Calvinists add, which is, well, now how you live it out. Instead, here's the forgiveness of sins right after the sermon, because you know you need it. Then we see you at the next Bible study or whatever. So I wrote this article, don't know if Lutheran Witness will print it because it is combat boot, stomp on your toes kind of thing. But Logia, the Lutheran theological journal said if Lutheran Witness doesn't take it, they're putting it in theirs. And it is something I'm seeing and crying about. I cried to my pastor, why am I seeing this? Why am I seeing evangelicalism and as Luther warned, well, not Luther, the writers of the solid uh, declaration wrote it. Enthusiasts should not be tolerated in our churches. And what I have found is enthusiasts and their enthusiasm being tolerated. How do you see 14 churches in the LCMS and I can't send him to one because he's asking for ancient church liturgy and I can't send him to one my heart broke I said do you mind traveling 40 miles outside of Orlando sure I'll do that found him one 14 not one except the Spanish one but it came so 13 I couldn't recommend one floodgates remember we talked the Mary thing it's a slippery slope this other stuff, slippery slope. Anyway. Something, one quick uh, thing I wanted to say about works is uh, something that a pastor said to, taught us back in my 20s is if then, uh, or uh, because therefore, sorry, because Jesus saved us and loved us, that's why we love others and work that's what our works are based in not to gain anything but to further the kingdom and to bring god's love to to the rest of the world and that that has helped me so all of this we have to do we have to have to have to do this that and the other thing we should whatever we need to all of those words are law and they have no place in in lutheran teaching at all in terms of our works and taught it comes from god down to us and then and then out to our neighbors yeah yeah Be because we want to because we are moved by the holy spirit and by god's love to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if anything yeah. that's where the emotion comes in right <laughs> yeah and i'm not negating emotion i mean i I, I had an emotional time this week at the service. I was ready to cry. Yes, emotional. I would never, ever, ever again say it was a mountaintop experience because I know where that leads. Mm. So I'm not going to do a slippery slope. And if I say it, someone else may pick up on it. And then they're looking online, what does this mean? And then they're right in error. So I will say, God gave us his gifts in his church, which had the word and the sacraments rightly distributed. That's where his gifts are. That's, yeah, I was thrilled. I was happy to see him be ordained and, the, and, and be prayed over and be commissioned by the church to shepherd over the flock God had given him. But there's, yeah, there's, a, there's a line and using even the Mary thing, there's a line you can cross even not knowing. And like I did with the quote, Terry, not realizing I looked up the rest of it. Yeah, the rest was fine. 
but I'm going to remove that meme because that's going to make someone slip. So delete, just delete it. Or as my title for my article, stop it, just stop it. <laughs> anyway, um, any other comments or questions? We're having a great time just chit-chatting. <laughs> All righty okay. then. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying on uh, the Jeremiah uh, text that we had on Sunday about uh, the shepherds not teaching properly. It just resonates with me of what's happening in the church today that the shepherds are not being good shepherds. And luckily we are blessedly, we have uh, Jesus as the good shepherd and he's the most important one. And hopefully that we'll continually raise up good shepherds for us. And we need to pray for our shepherds. Pray for our pastors, pray for yeah. our pastors. Yes. We need to pray for them. It is not easy. You know, the stuff on YouTube, TV, the radio, it's constantly bombarding them too. You know, I'm sure they want to see their churches grow. And let's face it, excitements, wrongly placed, do grow. But God grows his church by giving us the gifts we receive there. So I'm going to end there. Thank everyone for coming. Um, so next week, we're going to do kind of a little different style of apologetics, the literary. And I may even bring a little bit of C.S. Lewis and others, Dorothy Sayers, who've used more of a story. And then that gets disseminated and people read that and go, hmm, there's something more in there. And so we'll meet up with Marcus Minutius Felix. We'll just call him Mr. Felix because the rest of his name is really long. <laughs> in the Octavius. So if you want to look it online, check out some of the early Christian document websites. They have it in PDF form. Um, so I'm sure you'd be able to find it. Just type in the Octavius. If you want to prep, it is long. But it's really interesting because in the end, you'll find out a little interesting um, historical aspect of the book. Won't let it in now because that would ruin the surprise next week. Anyway, I will see Lord willing all of you next week. Um, same time, 2 p.m. Mountain Time. And remember, I'll be sending the link hopefully out Sundays. We came home so tired yesterday that I just did it this morning. So sorry you got the link late, but I'll send them out on Sunday, okay? Everyone have a wonderful week. You too.